Let me have you to open your Bibles to Psalm 116. Psalm 116. Psalm 116, I'm going to begin at the first verse, read down through verse 7. And we'll jump down after that from verses to verses 12 through 17. So if you're making notes, I'll give you that information. Psalm 116, let's begin at the very first verse. I love the Lord because he hath heard my voice and my supplications. Because he hath inclined his ear unto me, therefore will I call upon him as long as I live. The sorrows of death compassed me, and the pains of hell got hold upon me. I found trouble and sorrow. Then called I upon the name of the Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord, and righteous. Yea, our God is merciful. The Lord preserveth the simple. I was brought low, and he helped me. Return unto thy rest, O my soul, for the Lord hath dealt bountifully with thee. Now jump down to verse 12. What shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits toward me? I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows unto the Lord, now in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. O Lord, truly I am thy servant. I am thy servant and the son of thy handmaid. Thou hast loosed my bonds. I will offer to thee the sacrifice of thanksgiving and will call upon the name of the Lord. We'll stop right there. The one key verse I want you to focus on today is verse 12. What shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits toward me? So I call this sermon today, Responding to the Blessings. Responding to the Blessings. If you and I were truthful and honest with ourselves and honest before all of our Christian friends, you and I would all have to admit that in some way, God has been good to us. He's been better to me, as my father often says, God's better to me than I deserve. And I, I find myself repeating that phrase to people, uh, other Christians particularly, when I run into them. I ran into a girl uh, the other day, or I should say a woman now, a lady I went to high school with 40 years, 40 some years ago. <laughs> and um, she was a Christian in high school. Uh, I, we weren't real close friends at that time, but I've you know, seen her from time to time over the years. And uh, she asked me the other day, uh, how are you doing? I said, God's better to me than I deserve. And I'm going to, I'm just going to throw this out. I haven't mentioned it on camera for our YouTube and internet audience, but I'm going to say this up front because half of the audience, they probably click it off after they've seen 10 or 15 seconds of it. And it counts as a view though on YouTube, which is great. But, but anyway, uh, a year ago, I was diagnosed with esophageal cancer. A doctor said, it, and at the City of Hope here in Southern California, and my wife asked, uh, what stage was this at? And the, the doctor there said, stage four. And uh, when you hear that, you're not sure what to think. I did know that the next stage is death, and I kind of like to postpone that if I can. The Lord doesn't mind. And since September 2017, I've been getting chemotherapy every two weeks. And so sometimes you'll see me in the pulpit here. My nose is running, and I, I, I tend to be very emotional. The slightest little thing, I read something in the scriptures or something we sing in our songs, and it just strikes me uh, emotionally and as a great blessing. But I don't mean to snot and snort and slobber in front of everybody. So I, I ask your forgiveness for that. I've had three PET scans in the last nine months, and thus far, they've all been showing steady improvement. The, the, the lymph nodes in my torso, which are lighting up under the scan, some have disappeared completely, others are fading away, and nothing new is appearing on the scan. I think I'm due for another scan very 
soon. So, and I appreciate everyone's prayers for my sake. And except for maybe one weekend, I don't think I've missed a single Sunday behind the pulpit. And I thank God for that. But no matter how bad your circumstances may be, and this is my point, there's always somebody whose circumstances are worse than yours. And uh, the problem with modern, the modern world and modern liberalism is uh, they think their problem is the worst that's ever been experienced by any human being. They don't put it in perspective. You know, they were saying a few years ago that we're losing one soldier, two soldiers here and there, a roadside bomb uh, uh, in Afghanistan or Iraq, and you'd lose, uh, you know, 10 soldiers in a month, and that was a quagmire and a, and a d terrible thing we can never recover from. Do you know something? America lost up to 1,000 soldiers a day. At certain in certain battles during World War II. And not a single one of those vets came back blubbering, crying, I, I was triggered, I'm a social justice warrior, and that shouldn't happen to me. Shut up. They came back, they picked up their lives, went, went about their business, they had done what they ought to do to defend their country and the liberties and the things that we still enjoy, and thank God for them. I thank God for every vet, whether he's saved or not saved. And everyone should ought, ought, also ought to thank God for that. But uh, God's been good to everyone here. If you're a person older than me, and the older I get, the fewer of those people are. <laughs> but if you're someone older than me, and you still have a great measure of health that you enjoy, you still have uh, friends and family members who you love and they love you, you can still see and have uh, friendship with, and contact with, and God somehow supplies your financial needs, even when things look desperate, and you wonder, where am I going to get the money for that expense? And suddenly it comes in. God has been good to you. You're still able to eat solid food. God's been good to you. <laughs> for young people, let me say this. If you have parents who pay all the bills in your family, they keep a roof over your head, they keep warm clothes on your body and, and a warm bed to sleep in. Your refrigerator is full of food. And if you're in fourth grade and fifth grade and they foolishly gave you a smartphone, uh, that's icing on the cake, uh, God's been good to you. And everyone who was even, someone who's not even a believer in Jesus Christ ought to be able to see that every opportunity that comes to them wasn't of their own making. Many things come to you with some good things come to you, opportunities come to you, some door opens up for you at a job or some promotion you really had nothing to do with, but it was offered to you anyway. Some chance to do something that you had never planned on, it came to you uh, and you had no hand in arranging it. Those are blessings that come to you and God has been good to you, whether you're saved or lost. And uh, so in light of these blessings, in light of these circumstances, uh, what should we render unto the Lord? Psalm 12, or verse 12, rather, says, What shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits toward me? The Lord Jesus said in Luke 12, verse 48, Unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall be much required. And so the more blessing you have received from God, the more responsibility you have to do something in return for his kindness, for his benefits, for his blessings toward you. And people don't want to think that. They can't think any beyond the next five seconds. They're not thinking of what eternity may have in store for them if they don't respond to God's goodness. You know, the, God said when he was giving man a chance to repent while Nor Noah was building that ark, my spirit shall not always strive with man. There may come a day when you won't enjoy the blessings anymore. And, and good things won't happen to you any longer. You find yourself impoverished. You find yourself without a friend. You do some stupid thing and alienates all of your family members. They don't want to speak to you anymore. And what are you going to do? The United States certainly has much to give account for. And we've received so much. We've enjoyed so much. Uh, and without, without uh, fear of contradiction, this is the most prospered, um, or prosperous rather, and blessed nation of people that has ever existed in the history of planet Earth. 
And all of that wasn't because smart people and the Founding Fathers organized it that way. God had a hand in it. And we should never lose sight of that. And uh, to the extent that countries like South Korea and even Japan have tried to copy what the United States does or do very similar things that the, to, to the United States' conduct and welcoming in the gospel of Jesus Christ, uh, those countries have been blessed as well. But God is involved in it. And when people lose sight that God, there's a higher authority than the government. And uh, the government is going to answer to God. Uh, Psalm 9, verse 17 says, The wicked shall be turned into hell, and all and every nation that forgets God. In 1863, President Abraham Lincoln gave a speech to the nation right after the end of the, the Civil War. And he says, But we have forgotten God. And I got to tell you, in spite of great revivals, in spite of great opportunities, in spite of economic prosperity, this country still hasn't turned back to God. If this country had turned back to God wholesale as a Christian uh, a nation of profess professing Christians who still regard the Bible, if this country had turned to God uh, with those things um, as it should have, we wouldn't have gay marriage. We wouldn't have legalized pot. We wouldn't have uh, abortion on demand. A number of things wouldn't exist. And so I have to say, this country has still not turned back to God the way it should have. And I don't think we, are, we, we can expect some sweeping national revival. I'm glad we have the president that we have at the moment. Don't, don't get me wrong. A Hillary is a crook. Crooked Hillary. That mantra should be repeated uh, for eternity. And uh, cursings be upon her and her and her descendants. But, uh, but, but this nation has largely forgotten God. The so-called professing Christians of all the major Protestant denominations, they wouldn't know one end of the Bible from the other. You young people, I'm telling you, I've told you before, you have a greater depth and more broad knowledge and understanding of the scriptures than the average Protestant minister in this country does. Whether he be a Lutheran or an Episcopalian or Free Methodist or, or United Methodist, Free Methodist too, for that matter, um, you name it, they don't have more than five verses committed to memory. Ten at the outside most, and that's usually some Calvary Chapel minister um, learning it from some modern translation, but that's as far as they go. Our young people are going to go to uh, church camp in a week or two, and I've already given Sister Kim a chapter I want you all to memorize during that week, 20, 22, 23 verses. You'll come back in three or four days, have it all memorized, be able to recite it the following Sunday here at church. That's more than the average Protestant minister in this country knows. And um, uh, so let me move on. But this country has forgotten God and God has been, but God has been good to this country. God has been good to you. He's been good to me. He's still good to me. Better than I deserve. But point number one, what shall I render unto the Lord? A first response is found there in verse 13. I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. Point number one, get saved from your sin. If you're an unbeliever and you can recognize that not all the good things in life were of your doing or your making, some of it came without your involvement uh, for which you should be grateful for. Thank God you were born here and not born in Calcutta or Bombay, India or New Delhi or some part of sub-Saharan Africa. Thank God you weren't born in India where sewage runs through the streets. There's no clean drinking water, and none uh, feces and, and trash everywhere you go. No clean drinking water, not enough food for many people to eat. And they have a, they, they say they've abolished the caste system, but for all practical purposes, you still see it. The poor people are poor, they're born poor, and they're expected to stay poor for the rest of their lives. Those in the higher levels who are born into, say, a middle class level of, of uh, income, their fathers are engineers, their fathers are doctors, uh, they're expected to stay in that bracket. They're, they're expected to enjoy, they're entitled to enjoy that bracket, that income, that level of success, and they're expected to stay in that bracket. So that's why they ship their kids off to England or to the United States to go to college, to go to medical school. 
and uh, there are a lot of great doctors. I have uh, two doctors right now that are from India, and I'm, thank I'm thankful to God for them. I don't know if they're saved or not. I don't think they are. One of them I know isn't saved. I think she's uh, still probably Hinduistic, but they were born in a higher class, higher category. But thank God you weren't born there. Get saved from your sin. Every day God blesses you is one more day for which you're going to have to give account. Either at the great white throne judgment as an unsaved man or at the judgment seat of Christ. Did you just take it for granted? You know, when a man enters the workforce or a woman, they quickly learn it's not what you know. Sometimes it's who you know that helps you get that promotion, helps you get that raise. Helps you get an opportunity, open doors, open opens to you for better opportunity. And uh, if you've never trusted Jesus Christ by faith, the first thing you want to do is admit to God, I'm a sinner, God. I, I freely admit it. But I, and I also admit my own goodness, my own self-righteousness is insufficient to get me to heaven. It won't get me there. And I can only trust you and cast my entire life upon you and expect you to do what I can't do for myself. And on that basis, a great transaction takes place. You go from sinner to saint. And, the, and your sins are then put upon the dying body of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. And there's no problem with time and space in God's transaction. Uh, and his death covers the guilt and the consequence of all your sins. And his righteousness, because of that, is then imputed to you, according to Romans 4. So when God sees you, he no longer sees you lost and filthy and, and covered with the... the filth and sludge of your own wickedness, he sees you now covered with the perfection of his only begotten son. So the first response, of course, is to trust Jesus Christ to be your savior. Secondly, the writer of our psalm says in verse 14, I will pay my vows unto the Lord now in the presence of all his people. So point number two, pay what you've promised. Pay what you've promised. And what I mean by that is be a a man of your word or a woman of your word. A lot of people make promises to God. God, if you help me with this problem, I promise I'm going to start reading my Bible every day. If you answer this request of mine, God, or get me out of this tight spot that I got myself into, if you provide the funds to help me pay off that bill that I, I shouldn't have uh, uh, brought upon myself, you do this thing or do that thing for me, fix this family problem, or we're going to start going to church next Sunday. They, act, they treat God like a, like a kidnapper with a hostage. You know, you give me a million dollars, I'll release your daughter to you. You can't bargain with God like that. You can't do that with God. Why don't you start going to church, reading your Bible, and praying now, and then see if God blesses. But they say those things, and then they don't follow through. If you ever talk to God, now, now New Year's Eve is a great time, especially you Americans. We wait till New Year's Eve, and then we decide to make a new promise. I'm going to start doing this tomorrow morning. So you get up early in the morning. You're 5, 5.30 in the morning, and if you can muster the strength to get up that early on New Year's, Eve, New Year's Day. All right, I, I'm going to talk to God and pray, and now I'm going to read my Bible. You, start, you sit at the dining room table. You start reading your Bible, and someone else is over there 8 o'clock in the morning. Oh, the Rose Parade's on, so you watch that. I'll get back to my Bible later on. That's how you do, because you're weak in the flesh. You make promises you have no real intention of keeping. You try to find some way to not keep it and expect God to accept you and approve of you all the same. You can't do that. You wouldn't want your kids doing that to you or you doing it to your parents or some other friend. Promise to do something if they do something first. You do something first. This is a great difference between the golden rule as we've come to know it as believers do unto others as you would have others do unto you the golden rule and there I found a website simply called the golden rule.com and he, it, it quotes the the essential golden rule of multiple religions every religion has some version of that but in nearly every other one it is don't do to other people what you don't want them doing to you it's all mind your own business and don't get involved. But the Christian's golden rule is active. Do unto others as you would have others do unto you. You see the great difference in that. Start doing what you ought to do first and then see if God blesses. 
See if God answers your prayers more uh, positively and more quickly. We make vows to God. If you said, I'm going to read my Bible, read your Bible. If you said, I'm going to start going to church and not miss, then go to church and try not to miss. If you said, I'm going to start praying more, start praying more. If you said, I'm going to try to be a testimony, a witness for Jesus, and try it. Make some effort. Put some thought into it. Figure out what you can do, what you're good at, what you have talents to do, and then do it. But um, that's what this question is all about in verse 12. What shall I render unto the Lord? God wants men and women of character, not characters who call themselves men and women. We have plenty of those in the world today. And a very important thing if, as a Christian is to keep your word, as pay what you've promised. Point number three, verse 17, jump, jump down there, says, I will offer to thee the sacrifice of thanksgiving and will call upon the name of the Lord. Just like he says earlier in verse 13. And this is point number three, be grateful to God. Be grateful to God. The way any man or woman should respond for all the benefits God has showered upon them is to be truly thankful. Truly thankful. Uh, he calls it, I will offer the sacrifice of thanksgiving. Hebrews 13 verse 15 says, By him therefore let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is, the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name. It's a sad fact that too many people, especially young kids these days, they're not taught to be polite. They're not taught to show respect to others or let alone respect to elders. They don't say please. They don't say yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. They don't apologize when they're offensive. I, was, I went down to Vince's Spaghetti. God bless Vince's Spaghetti for their, for their menu. Last night, in order to, and bought a bunch of food. On Saturday night, however, the, the, dining, the waiting area just inside the restaurant is wall to wall, shoulder to shoulder. And uh, so I ordered the food to go and I was waiting for my number to be called and in comes some couple, they got a couple of young children walking with them and the wife's pushing this ginormous baby uh, stroller with a baby in it, just boom, plowing through like, like somebody parting the Red Sea. Uh, and no thank you, no, no, no excuse me, no pardon me, excuse us, and then we squeeze on through. I thought, you know, if that kid wasn't in that stroller, I'd be kicking that stroller all over the restaurant. <laughs> they don't learn how to show some manners. Good decency. You know, good decency will open up a lot of doors for you. Politeness, kindness. But... Um, it's a sad fact that many people aren't taught to say thank you. I hope you're a thankful Christian. You certainly should be. But not only does the Bible say, 1 Thessalonians 5.18, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. But it also says in Ephesians 5, verse 20, giving thanks always for all things to God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Not just the good things, bad things as well. I thank God for my medical diagnosis last year. I didn't know what it was going to bring, but I do know this. If you go to God, you've got a very serious dilemma, and thank Him for it, it causes you to trust Him more. It causes you to say, I'm limited in what I can do, God. All I can do is trust you. I heard someone say once, there are two things in the world you should never worry about. The things you can change and the things you can't change. That takes in just about everything. If I can change my circumstances, then there's no need to worry. If I can't change it, there's no point in worrying. So be thankful to God. God's kinder to you than you, than you realize. If you were to pause and take stock, You'd realize and take inventory of your life. You'd realize there are certain things that I could never have done on my own and for which I have to thank God for. How many of you have ever had some near miss on the streets or the highways while you're driving? And if there weren't I mean, a split second uh, difference one way or the other, and you would have been wiped out. 
I've had a number of those. I was driving down the street one day, uh, heading uh, west, and there was someone heading east, and we're both approaching a signal light at the same four-way traffic light. And you know, the light goes from green to yellow. You only have a couple of seconds to try either beat it or slow down. So I was heading west, and this guy wanted to make a left-hand turn right in front of me. <laughs> And we both decided we're going to try to beat that light. So all I could do was cross over the yellow, double yellow and then back into my lane so he could go and I didn't smash into him. Thankfully, there was nobody else around. I was driving on the, the, uh, the uh, 10 freeway here up uh, near 4th Street heading east one time. And off the far, I was in the inside lane. I think it was before we had the carpool uh, letters in the fast lane. And uh, there was a car in the outside lane. All of a sudden, the guy's tire blows out and comes right off the wheel and starts bouncing in the freeway, heading my direction. And it, it came right to the center divider and just laid there and, and stopped. And I just kept on going. God got me through that one. I was in Pensacola driving on the uh, is it a freeway. What's it? 110? Is there a 110? Driving in there and heading north in town. And then it curves and head a little bit west. And some car up ahead of me crashed into the, the concrete, you know, border on the outside of the lane. Metal flying everywhere. It came up. My car went through, and it rained down. Didn't, not a piece hit our car. I mean, you're doing 55 miles an hour. You can't just stop there and go see if someone needs help. I just had to get, keep going and trust that the guy was okay and the highway patrol would, would take care of the rest. So thank God for near misses. I'll tell you another stupid thing that was my fault, and I've told you the story before, but not everybody's watched, uh, watching might have heard it. I was about 10 years old. My dad would take my brother and I out to the city garbage dump after he'd done a lot of work. His pickup truck was full of trash, and He's out there sweeping, he's sweeping out the, the, the bed of his pickup truck and getting rid of the stuff. We're jump, stepping through other people's trash looking for treasures, my brother. <laughs> a garbage dump's a, a fun place if you're a kid. Lots of great things out there. But I was looking down at something and this shadow came over my head and was covering the, the space in front of me. And I turned around and one of those big caterpillars was pushing a mountain of trash in my direction. He was about six feet away from me and I jumped out of the way. It was noisy out there, and he, he never saw me. He just kept going. And then I saw my dad was yelling for me, but it was so loud, I didn't hear my dad yelling for me to get out. Of, get out. I managed to jump out of the way. I think he said, get in the truck, stay there. <laughs> I think I stayed in the pickup truck. I was happy to stay in the pickup truck. I didn't want to get out there and risk getting hit by another bulldozer. But be thankful to God for everything you enjoy. We're not thankful to God. We do a lot of stupid things and God delivers us out of them. And then we say, God, if you help me with it, I, I promise I'll give you thanks. Start giving him thanks first. Thank God for all the problems in life you don't have. As I said earlier this morning, no matter how bad your problem is, there's always somebody whose problem is worse. So thank, thank the Lord. You're not in their situation. And point number four, and lastly today, notice what the legacy of a faithful man or woman ought to be up in verse 15. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. And point number four is this. Don't die in disgrace. Do something for God. Make the best use of the life you have. Make your life count for God. Will that be said of you someday that, that he or she lived for the Lord Jesus Christ? They were faithful to serve God with everything they had uh, until the day they died. I hope and pray and trust that it will be. And uh, the body of Christ reaches back centuries to the dying thief on the cross right next to the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, fortunately, the way our memories are, the way human nature is, we like to recall the good things in life. The good memories seem to stay with us, and those get recorded in the history books more than the bad things. 
someone who was increasing, exceedingly bad, like an Adolf Hitler, some a dictator, certainly they're known for wickedness. But generally speaking, history books and biographies record the positive and the most uh, blessed elements of someone's life and the good things they did far more than they record the small, incidental, even bad things that they did, which is good. Uh, since that's the case, we think of great Christians in the past. We think of well, Martin Luther in the 1500s. We think of John Wesley in the 1700s. Think of great Christians like Fanny Crosby, a songwriter, and others. And we think of them, the things that they did. We think of great preachers like D.L. Moody and Billy Sunday. We think of great Christians who've done wonderful things which we admire in retrospect. And you know good and well, they were human too. They had their faults and their flaws, and they had committed their sin. In fact, it was their sin that brought them to Jesus Christ, right? So we remember the good things they've done and the things that we enjoy because of them. Now, either your life will reflect positively on their lives and the continuation of that, or it'll reflect negatively on the cause of Christ. You can't damage their reputations, but you can reflect negatively on the same Savior you say you follow. Either your life will be a, a, a continuation of their great reputations, or it'll be a disgrace. You'll, be a, you'll be, bring shame and embarrassment to the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't want to do that. I don't want to die someday and, and have it be said to me, he loved his entertainment, he loved his television, he loved the internet too much, he loved his possessions too much, uh, he had all of these things but had very little time for God. I don't want that to be said of me. James 4, verse 4 says, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. You don't want that to be said about you. I don't want to be the enemy of God. It's good to have friends in high places. And if you're a friend of God's, then you've got nothing to worry about. So I, I want it to be said of me someday that I, he lived for Jesus Christ until the, the day he died, till he drew his last breath. And so should you desire the same thing. Find something to do for God's sake, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake. I talked about prayer and I talked about reading your Bible. How many Christians never read their Bible from cover to cover? They can be saved 35, 40 years before they die, and they've never read the entire Bible all the way through. What do you think the Bible's here for? Just look nice for you to carry on Sunday mornings with a nice matching cover that matches your shoes or something? It's not here just to look good on your coffee table at home or to sit on your dining room table and then, oh, I better remember to take my Bible to church. You haven't thought about it all week. Why worry about it on Sunday? So, if you were to go to, let's say you run over to Chick Publication, and we're blessed here at our church. Chick Publications is only four miles from our church building. I've measured it once. Four miles from our church building. Jack T. Chick, Jack Thomas Chick, I had the privilege of working for many years ago. Um, I don't know how many titles he wrote, 150, maybe more, just the small tracks alone, never mind the comics. And each one of those tracks is considered a, a book, a categorized as a book by the Library of Congress, 24 pages that constitutes an actual book. I think This Was Your Life, they translated in well over a hundred languages and uh, nearly a billion tracks have gone out of that place in the last 50 years. But do you know something that makes Jack Chick the most widely circulated author in the history of Christianity? Second only to the Apostle Paul. And yet, nobody knows Jack Chick's name. Very few people know who he was. It just says JTC on the front of the tracks. But that made him, I think when you think about it, the most widely published and circulated author in the history of the Christian church, second only to the Apostle Paul in the New Testament. And he found something to do. But if you go drive over there, find a, a track that you've read and you, you like the message of it, it's kind of, your style, that's, that's what I would like to say to people, but maybe I don't have the right words. Buy two packs of those tracks. 25 
tracks in a package, buy two packages, that's 50 tracks. If you resolve to pass out just one track a week, that's 50 tracks in a year, I promise, let me tell you something, that's 50 tracks more than the average Protestant minister is ever going to pass out in his lifetime. That's 50 opportunities for you to witness or to plant a seed. Give a track to somebody, listen, you're, you're going through the checkout stand at the grocery store, and uh, you know how the, the person at the register, they ask every person, how are you today? Of course, they don't mean it. They're just trying to shuffle, shuffle you through. Say, I'm doing fine. Listen, I can see you're busy, and I don't want to take up your time, and you've, you've got customers behind me, but I'm a Christian. I care about people, and I care about their spiritual lives. Let me offer you something to read. Food for thought. Don't read it now. Read it later. The next time, I, if you see me next time, you can tell me what you think of it. If the person's a Christian, they'll more than likely tell you they're a Christian. If they go to church somewhere, they'll more than likely tell you we, we go somewhere. If they're not saved, if they've if they got any kind of decency about them, they'll say, well, thank you, any, thank you, and put it in their pocket. But you are planting a seed or you're watering a seed someone before you planted. And you never can tell what God might do with it. And uh, in his own good time, if he wants, and if they're willing, and they acknowledge, it'll, it'll spring forth through eternal life. You may come along, and somebody says, you know what, I wish somebody would have talked to me about this. Where do you go to church? They'll ask you where you go. You can invite them and say, I'd like you to come visit us sometime. Let them know what times we have services and so forth. Tell them, hey, our preacher buys donut holes every Sunday. They're great. They're fantastic. So, uh, but do something. I... You say, well, one track a week, that doesn't sound very difficult. It, it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be. But when you say 50 tracks, that's 50 opportunities to witness to somebody that uh, the average Christian never avails himself of. All right, I'm going to bring this to a close. And we're going to uh, finish right here. Get saved from sin. Pay what you've promised to God. Be grateful to God. And fourthly, don't die in disgrace. Uh, this is what I call responding to the blessings.